The Battle of the North Cape was a Second World War naval battle which occurred on 26 December 1943, as part of the Arctic Campaign. The German battleship Scharnhorst, on an operation to attack Arctic convoys of war material from the Western Allies to the Soviet Union, was brought to battle and sunk by the Royal Navy, the battleship HMS Duke of York with cruisers and destroyers including an onslaught from the Hunstord of the exiled Royal Norwegian Navy, off Norway's North Cape. The battle was the last between big and capital ships in the war between Britain and Germany. The British victory confirmed the massive strategic advantage held by the British, at least in surface units. It was also the second to last engagement between battleships, the last being the Battle of Surigao Strait in October 1944. Chapter 1 Background Since August 1941, the Western Allies had run convoys of ships from the United Kingdom and Iceland to the northern ports of the Soviet Union to provide essential supplies for their war effort on the Eastern Front. These endured much hardship, frequently attacked by German naval and air forces stationed in occupied Norway. A key concern were German Kriegsmariner battleships, such as the Tirpitz and Scharnhorst. Even the threat of these ships' presence was enough to cause disastrous consequences for the convoys, such as convoy PQ-17 that was scattered and mostly sunk by German forces after false reports of the Tirpitz sailing to intercept them. To ward off the threat of Germany's capital ships in the Arctic and to escort convoys with a high level of success, the Royal Navy had to outlay great assets. Operation Ostfront was an attempt by the German Kriegsmariner to intercept the expected Arctic convoys. In late December 1943, there was a Russia-bound convoy JW 55B consisting of 19 cargo vessels under the command of the Commodore, retired Rear Admiral Maitland Boucher, accompanied by a close escort of two destroyers, HMCS Huron and an HMCS Hyda, among others, and an ocean escort of eight home fleet destroyers led by HMS Onslow. Also in the area was convoy RA 55A, returning to the United Kingdom from Russia, consisting of 22 cargo ships, accompanied by a close escort of two destroyers and four other vessels, and an ocean escort of six home fleet destroyers led by HMS Milne. It had arrived safely at Murmansk with its normal escorts and the additional protection by Force 1, commanded by Vice Admiral Robert Burnett, consisting of the cruiser HMS Belfast, the flagship, and the cruisers HMS Norfolk and Sheffield. Escorting the convoys to Russia was the responsibility of the home fleet, and its commander in chief, Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser. Fraser wished to neutralize Scharnhorst, a major threat to the convoys, and planned a confrontation over Christmas 1943 in which convoy JW 55B would be used to draw the enemy out. Fraser expected and hoped that Scharnhorst would attempt to attack JW 55B. At a conference of the captains of the ships in his force Fraser described his plan to intercept Scharnhorst at a position between the convoy and the enemy's Norwegian base. He would then approach the enemy to within 12,000 yards in the Arctic night, illuminate Scharnhorst with star shell, and open fire using fire control radar. Convoy JW 55B had left Lockyer on 20 December and was sighted two days later by a Luftwaffe aircraft which commenced shadowing. By 23 December it was clear to the British from intelligence reports that the convoy had been sighted and was being shadowed by enemy aircraft. Fraser then put to sea with Force 2 consisting of his flagship the battleship HMS Duke of York, the cruiser HMS Jamaica and S-class destroyers HMS Savage, Scorpion, Samarez, and Hunnam's stored of the exiled Royal Norwegian Navy. Fraser was anxious not to discourage Scharnhorst from leaving its base, so did not approach before it was necessary to do so. As JW 55B and its escorts approached the area of greatest danger on the same day, the 23rd, traveling slowly eastward 250 miles off the coast of North Norway, Burnett and Force 1 set out westward from Murmansk while Fraser with Force 2 approached at moderate speed from the west. On 25 December, Scharnhorst with the Nardic class destroyers Z-29, Z-30, Z-33, Z-34 and Z-38 left Norway's Alterfjord under the overall command of Contra-Admiral Erik Bay. 
Scharnhorst set course for the convoy's reported position as a southwesterly gale developed. Chapter 2 Battle Fraser received confirmation from the Admiralty in the early hours of 26 December that Scharnhorst was at sea and searching for convoy JW 55B. The stormy weather had resulted in the grounding of all Luftwaffe reconnaissance planes. With no ability to search for the British ships from the air and heavy seas hampering the movement of his ships, Rear Admiral Bay was unable to locate the convoy. Despite a German U boat spotting the convoy and reporting its position, Bay was still not able to make contact with the British ships. Thinking he had overshot the enemy, he detached his destroyers and sent them southward to increase the search area, and the destroyers subsequently lost contact with their flagship. Admiral Fraser, preparing for the German attack, had diverted the returning empty convoy RA-55A northward, out of the area in which it was expected, and ordered JW-55B to reverse course to allow him to close. He later ordered four of the destroyers with RA-55A, Matchless, Musketeer, Opportune, and Virago, to detach and join him. The now unescorted Scharnhorst encountered Burnett's force one shortly after nine o'clock. Belfast was the first ship to obtain radar contact on Scharnhorst, and the British cruisers rapidly closed the range. At a distance of nearly 13,000 yards, the British cruisers opened fire and Scharnhorst responded with her own salvos. While no hits were scored on the British ships, the German battleship was struck twice, with one shell destroying the forward seat at radar controls and leaving Scharnhorst virtually blind in a mounting snowstorm. Without radar, gunners aboard the German battleship were forced to aim at the enemy's muzzle flashes. This was made more difficult because two of the British cruisers were using a new flashless propellant, leaving Norfolk the relatively easier target. They, believing he had engaged a battleship, turned south in an attempt to distance himself from the pursuers and perhaps draw them away from the convoy. Scharnhorst's superior speed allowed Bay to shake off his pursuers, after which he turned northeast in an attempt to circle round them and attack the undefended convoy. Burnett, instead of giving chase in sea conditions that were limiting his cruiser's speed to 24 knots, correctly guessed Bay's intentions and positioned Force 1 so as to protect the convoy. It was a decision that he had some personal doubts about as it would result in the cruisers losing contact with Scharnhorst, and the decision was criticized by some of the British forces other officers but supported by Fraser. To Burnett's relief, shortly after noon, Scharnhorst was once again detected by the cruiser's radars as it attempted to approach the convoy. As fire was again exchanged, Scharnhorst scored two hits on Norfolk with 11-inch shells, disabling a turret and her radar. Burnett's destroyers were also unable to get close enough to Scharnhorst to launch a torpedo attack on the German ship. Following this exchange, Bay decided to return to port, while he ordered his destroyers to attack the convoy at a position reported by the U-boat earlier in the morning. The reported position was out of date, and the destroyers missed the convoy. Scharnhorst ran south for several hours, once again taking advantage of its superior speed. Burnett pursued, but both Sheffield and Norfolk suffered engine problems and were forced to drop back, leaving the outgunned Belfast as the sole pursuer and dangerously exposed for a while. The lack of working radar aboard Scharnhorst prevented the Germans from taking advantage of the situation, allowing Belfast to reacquire the German ship on her radar set. Unbeknownst to Bay, his ship was now sailing into a trap with Admiral Fraser's main force steaming towards Scharnhorst's position and perfectly placed to intercept the fleeing German ship. With Belfast sending a constant stream of radio signals on the Scharnhorst's position, the battleship Duke of York battled through the rough seas to reach the German ship. Fraser sent his four escorting destroyers to press ahead and try to get into torpedo launching positions. The main British force soon picked up Scharnhorst on radar at 16.15 and were manoeuvring to bring a full broadside to bear. 
At 1617 Scharnhorst was detected by Duke of York's Type 273 radar at a range of 45,500 yards and by 1632 Duke of York's Type 284 radar indicated that the range had closed to 29,700 yards. At 1648, Belfast fired star shells to illuminate Scharnhorst. Scharnhorst, unprepared with her turrets trained fore and aft, was clearly visible from Duke of York. Duke of York opened fire at a range of 11,920 yards and scored a hit on the first salvo, disabling Scharnhorst's foremost turrets, while another salvo destroyed the ship's aeroplane hangar. Bay turned north, but was engaged by the cruisers Norfolk and Belfast, and turned east at a high speed of 31 knots. Scharnhorst was now being engaged on one side by Duke of York and Jamaica while Burnett's cruisers engaged from the other side. The Germans took continuing heavy punishment from Duke of York's 14-inch shells, and at 1724 a desperate bay signaled to Germany am surrounded by heavy units. Bay was able to put some more distance between Scharnhorst and the British ships to increase his prospects of success. Two 11-inch shells from one of her salvos passed through the masts of the Duke of York, severing all the wireless aerials, and, more serious still, the wires leading from the radar scanner to the Type 284 gunnery control radar set. These hits could not have been known to Bay, and Lieutenant H.R.K. Bates' RNVR climbed the mast and managed to repair the broken wires. Scharnhorst's fortunes took a dramatic turn for the worse at 1820 when a shell fired by Duke of York at extreme range pierced her belt armor and destroyed the number one boiler room. Scharnhorst's speed dropped to only 10 knots, and though immediate repair work allowed it to recover to 22 knots, Scharnhorst was now vulnerable to torpedo attacks by the destroyers. Five minutes later, Bay sent his final radio message to the German naval command, we will fight on until the last shell is fired. At 1850 Scharnhorst turned to starboard to engage the destroyers Savage and Saumarez, but this allowed Scorpion and the Norwegian destroyer Stord to attack with torpedoes, scoring one hit on the starboard side. As Scharnhorst continued to turn to avoid the torpedoes, Savage and Saumarez scored three hits on her port side. Samarez was hit several times by Scharnhorst's secondary armament and suffered 11 killed and 11 wounded. Due to the torpedo hits, Scharnhorst's speed again fell to 10 knots, allowing Duke of York to rapidly close the range. With Scharnhorst illuminated by star shells hanging over her like a chandelier, Duke of York and Jamaica resumed fire, at a range of only 10,400 yards. At 1915, Belfast joined in from the north. The British vessels subjected the German ship to a deluge of shells, and the cruisers Jamaica and Belfast fired their remaining torpedoes at the slowing target. Scharnhorst's end came when the British destroyers Opportune, Virago, Musketeer and Matchless fired a further 19 torpedoes at her. Racked with hits and unable to flee, Scharnhorst finally capsized and sank at 1945 on the 26th of December, her propellers still turning, at an estimated position of 72 degrees 16 and 28 degrees 41 e. She was later identified and filmed at 72 degrees 31 and 28 degrees 15 e. Of her total complement of 1,968, only 36 were pulled from the frigid waters, 30 by Scorpion and 6 by Matchless. Neither Rear Admiral Bay nor Captain Hintzey were among those rescued, nor were any other officers. Scorpion tried to rescue Bay but he foundered. British casualties, in contrast, were relatively light with only 21 killed and 11 wounded. The majority of British casualties occurred on Samarez, with 11 of the destroyer's sailors being killed as the ship attempted to close with Scharnhorst. HMS Norfolk suffered most of the remaining casualties with seven of her men being killed while the destroyer Scorpion also had one of its men missing in action. Fraser ordered the force to proceed to Murmansk, making a signal to the Admiralty, Scharnhorst sunk, to which the reply came, Grand, well done. Chapter 3, Aftermath 
Later in the evening of 26 December, Admiral Fraser briefed his officers on board Duke of York, Gentlemen, the battle against Scharnhorst has ended in victory for us. I hope that if any of you are ever called upon to lead a ship into action against an opponent many times superior, you will command your ship as gallantly as Scharnhorst was commanded today. After the battle Admiral Fraser sent the following message to the Admiralty, please convey to the sea in sea Norwegian Navy. Stort played a very daring role in the fight and I am very proud of her. In an interview in the evening news on 5 February 1944 the commanding officer of HMS Duke of York, Captain Guy Russell, said, the Norwegian destroyer Stord carried out the most daring attack of the whole action. The loss of Scharnhorst demonstrated the vital importance of radar in modern naval warfare. While the German battleship should have been able to outgun all of her opponents save the battleship Duke of York, the early loss of radar-assisted fire control combined with the problem of inclement weather left her at a significant disadvantage. Scharnhorst was straddled by 31 of the 52 radar-fire-controlled salvos fired by Duke of York. In the aftermath of the battle, the Kriegsmariner commander, Gross Admiral Karl Dunitz remarked, surface ships are no longer able to fight without effective radar equipment. The sinking of the Scharnhorst was a major victory for the Allied war effort in the Arctic theater and further altered the strategic balance at sea in their favor. The Battle of the North Cape took place only a few months after the successful Operation Source, which had severely damaged the German battleship Tirpitz as she lay at anchor in Norway. With Scharnhorst destroyed and Germany's other battleships out of service, the Allies were now for the first time in the war free from the threat of German battleships raiding their convoys in the Arctic and Atlantic. This would allow the Allies to reallocate their naval resources that had been previously tied up to counter the threat of the German fleet in being. This would prove to be the final battle of battleships in European waters and was one of few major surface ship-on-ship -ship battles in the Second World War without air support.